Uh, anyway, all right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for this great day. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for everyone that is here. And thank you for the rain. Lord, we know you give us what we need. Not always what we ask for, but what we need. Lord, I just pray for everybody that's here. I pray for the people that couldn't be here. And I pray that you be with us and help me to get the word out the way you want it to be presented. And then pray that it is accepted the way that you want it to be accepted. In Jesus' name, amen. So I got good news and bad news. The good news, you have a Sunday school teacher here today. The bad news is I'm going to be here for the next three weeks. So take that for however you want to. So we're going to try to get through, I told Joe, four chapters today, and I don't see a lot of confidence floating around out here. So two chapters, I think, has been our max, but I've got in my mind that we're going to make it through four, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yep, that's how far we're going to go. I may have to make Pastor Kate wait. No, I'm not going to do that. He might fire me. I can't afford to take a cut and pay. All right, here we go. Let's start. All right, let's just do a little background because I don't get to teach every week and, it, and it's hard, especially people that are not here every week. We are studying the book of Job. It is my goal, Lord willing, that we're going to go all the way through the book of Job, start to finish. So far, we have learned a little bit about, you know, how good Job had it and how bad it's going now. We went through uh, 10 chapters, and um, now the friends that were rock solid are not so rock solid anymore. So we have, uh, he has endured two, now three of his friends, uh, telling him everything he's done wrong, which they know nothing about because he's done nothing wrong. And we all, we have learned that. So, anyway, the friends have, they are basically fire weather friends. And as we'll find out today, they are, uh, ah, let's just study it as we go. Let's start in chapter 11, Job chapter 11. And uh, Zophar here is, uh, just keeps running his mouth for lack of a better term. So, here we go. Then Zophar, the... Nehemiah replied, Should this abundance of words go unanswered, and such a talker be acquitted? Should your babblings put others to silence, so that you can keep on ridiculing with no one to hum humiliate you? You have said, My teaching is sound, and I am pure in your sight. But if only God would speak and open his lips against you, he would show you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Know then that God has chosen to overlook some of your iniquity. Can you fathom the depths of God or discover the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They are deeper than the shoals. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. Funny how they talk about longer than the earth and wider than the sea. That just was something that stuck out with me. If he passes by and throws someone in prison or convenes a court, who can stop him? Surely he knows which people are worthless. If he sees iniquity, will he not take note of it? Be a stupid person will gain, but a stupid person will gain understanding as soon as the wild he is born a human. As for you, if you redirect your heart and spread out your hands to him in prayer, if there is iniquity in your hand, remove it. And don't allow justice to dwell in your tent. Then you will hold your head high, free from fault. You will be firmly established and unafraid. For you will forget your suffering, recalling it only as water that has flowed by. Your life will be brighter than noonday. Its darkness will be like the morning. You will be confident because there is hope. You will look carefully about and lie down in safety. You will lie down with no one to frighten you, and many will seek your favor. But the sight of the wicked will fail. Their way of escape will be cut off, and their only hope is their last breath. So, here we are... Uh,
Dr. Evans talked about right here in uh, chapter 11 that, uh, <laughs> that Zophar never took a class on winning friends. Basically, in the next year, <laughs> he just keep piling on. We've learned this leading up to this point that all of his friends had just keep throwing him under the bus, as we'd say today. He was completely insensitive to Job's situation. He accused Job of babbling on, and he also implied that Job was worthless and stupid. I just. Uh, I ain't got really nothing good to say about that. Because in my, if you follow me on Facebook, in my trying to do better in life, uh, I made a comment the other day that I spent my whole life learning about Jesus instead of my whole life learning how to live Christ's life, like Jesus. And I have really tried to change my ways and that statement that Dr. Evans made right there hit home. Now, was I that bad? I don't know. I went on that side of the fence. But I'm going to tell you a story. Some of you will think it's funny and it has nothing to do with it. But it does. Keisha, now I'm starting to doubt if we're going to get through all these chapters, Jill. Keisha grew up like mine and Tammy's whole family. We grew up diehard Alabama fans. Hardcore Alabama fans. We had been Alabama fans our whole life. We had friends with that were big donors at Alabama. We didn't have to pay for tickets. We had great seats. We had a lot of access. Keisha got to be a junior in high school. You know, you have to start picking out what school you want to go to. Or start at least narrowing it down. Keisha, uh, because of many other factors, was basically getting full ride scholarships, combined scholarships that made them full rides through her hearing, through Indian, and through her grades. She was going to get to go to school anywhere she wanted to go, basically. She could go to Auburn, uh, Alabama, and Mississippi State and Jacksonville, that was the four biggies that she was trying to decide. Well, Keisha automatically, she was a band geek like her daddy, so she always wanted to play in the million dollar band. So she said, I'm going to go to Alabama. No questions asked. Dream come true. I'm going to Alabama. Being the good parents, me and Tammy is, we thought it was disrespectful to not and go and visit schools that make you offers. See what's out there. At least go and look. So we spend a lot of weekends and a lot of weeknights going to different recruiting parties where they recruit honor students to come to their school. So we go to these parties and then we go visit these campuses. Well, when we go visit Auburn, end of the story. She's going to Auburn. Well, a long story short is, and I, I want to say this in the nicest way as possible, but I don't know how other way of saying it. The moment Keisha decides to go to Auburn, our life, I've seen the other side of the fence. I was warned immediately from friends of mine that I went to school with about what was fixing to happen. It got ugly, and it got ugly really quick. We, didn't, we wound up coming to church here before Keisha went to Auburn. That had nothing to do with it. But while we were at our other church, they were leadership meetings and people called to the pastor's office because of this. We had, at the time, me and Tammy had a, our dream home that we lived in in the rainfall, and we had this big old open area. So every year, prior to all this, and still we continued it on, we had the big Iron Bowl party at our house. Had plenty of room. We could have a ton of people. 
And it was all in good fun. Win or lose, everybody had fun. It was all about eating, laughing, playing, cutting up. That's what it was all about. We invited everybody, both sides of the fence. And because I had family members that were diehard Auburn fans. Anyway, at that event that year, a particular diehard Bama fan was escorted out by his wife. I said all that to say this. I had to stop and reflect on my life as an Alabama fan due to what I was seeing on the other side of the field. You don't realize, and that's the change I've been trying to do lately, is before I say anything on Facebook or do anything or anything I say or do, I try to stop myself, read it, think about it, or analyze it as much as I can before I do it, because what may be good fun to me and Ricky, and me and Ricky, we can talk Alabama and Auburn football and cut up, we have a good time with it. What may be good fun to us, and I'm going to say what might have been good fun to me as a diehard Bama fan, might have been too much. When I read that, <laughs> That hit home, and when I've been doing, and I've been talking to Tammy, and I've been reading a lot of books. Uh, if you want to know some good books, I've got some good books. It's really changed my life. But when I started going through this change, I had to think about what was I projecting as a Christian. Even though my intent was good, my intent as an Alabama fan was to be a Die-hard Bama fan. Everybody else were losers. What not a better team in the country then. And that's been a long time ago. They're even better now. I kid people now. I said, you can take the boy out of Tuscaloosa if you can't take Tuscaloosa out of the boy. I know more about Alabama football still today than I do about Auburn. But I'm a dad. Wherever my kids go, I go. I'm a big UNA fan now. That's where Thomas goes. But I had good intentions as an Alabama fan. I had really good intentions as a Christian. But I let my die-hard stance on things. I'm not going to say I let it. I didn't mean for it to happen that way. It just came out that way. My political stance were rock solid. And I spoke my mind in defense of my Christian values. Abortion is one of them. And other things. There's a lot of other things. And I have friends on a lot of issues on both sides of the fence. It hit me one day. And that's when I started reevaluating my Christ-like life. That there is no way under the sun... I could win over anybody at the rate I was going. And I'm going to say this, and I don't mean it toward our church in a derogatory way. I just question this thought. Have y'all noticed that we'll go a month sometimes and nobody will, we won't have any visitors or nobody will get saved? In a year's time, if there is 10, 15 people that get saved, that'd be a pretty good bit. We just don't see it. I remember going to church as a kid and you've seen it all the time. Have we let TV, the static, y'all heard me talk about the static. I can tell now we are not going to make it. But anyway, I think it's important. Y'all heard me talk about the static. We still need to be rock solid in our values. We don't need to cave. But Bob Goff wrote a good book that said, Love does. So Christ is love. That's where love comes from. So if love does, then 
we got to figure out a better avenue. Job's friends could have easily... We'll read on over here if we get to that point about some different aspects of it. But they could have easily... And they started off good. You know, they started off with him. Praying with him. Uh, They could have easily joined hand in hand with him because they knew Job to be a good man. Because everything started happening is when they started doubting that he was as good a man as he said he was. But would it not have been easier to have helped him knowing that he, and he still held on to his faith, would it not have been easier for me to say, Ricky, I know you're a man of God. Let's pray through this. Let's keep walking. Don't give up. Versus, well, if he had done something wrong, that's not nothing to them. I, I know they were taking the high road, and I need to shut up because we're going to talk about this a little later on. But there is no way under the sun that a lot of my Auburn friends would have come to my Alabama party knowing me. Or my Iron Bowl party. Knowing me. Same thing applies here. Knowing how diehard I was, it's okay to be diehard. Knowing how rough around the edges and lack of a bedside manner that I had, I doubt I could have talked to anybody into coming to church with me. And you'll notice I didn't bring many people. It's hard to get people anyway. I understand that. But I know I'm not the only one. I don't think that God let me. I struggled this week about changing what I was going to teach on this week. I started to pull off a week and teach on something else that I really had laid on my heart. And I know the Lord didn't let me continue to do this. For absolutely no reason. Let's go on. I want to. I do want to try to get on. So basically, Lofar told Job that he was worthless and stupid. Uh, and Doctor Evans said, "What was interesting here is Zophar shared Job's longing for a hearing before God, but for a different reason. Job was sure God would vindicate him if he could just present his case." Zophar said the opposite would happen. God was letting Job off easy, so if Job were to go to court with God, he would surely be condemned. He felt Job should be thankful things weren't as bad as they could be. This keeps driving the nails in the coffin, so saying goes. He wasn't helping. He was making things worse. He was, all he was doing was driving a wedge between their friendship. And Job, actually, you know, I told y'all how it would be cool to be Job sometimes rather than going through everything he had to go through. Job, another football reference, made the first string and he's getting approved. it. All we see is he's suffering through his friends. But no, the Lord is making the devil look weak because the devil keeps throwing everything at him, including his wife and friends. Don't forget his wife. And Job is standing his ground. He's the lineman that the coach keeps throwing somebody at him all day for you know all day every day with the best people he can, and he still. Nick Saban says the best player will learn how to do his part the same way. Every time, a hundred times, the same way, without changing, that's the only way you win games. Job is doing it the same way every time, no matter who it is, every time, a hundred times, no matter what, he don't change a lick. No matter how much the devil throws at him and who that person is, Job is standing his ground. Let's go on here. He says here in uh, verse 13 through 14, like a good preacher, I love what Dr. Evans said there, Zophar had three points, Zophar had three points in his message to Job concerning the steps he needed to take. First, Job needed to redirect his heart. 
to God. Job needed to stop living in sin. There we go. And conduct his life in a righteous way. Second, he needed to spread out his hands to God in prayer, which is probably a reference to a prayer of repentance. Third, Job needed to get rid of any iniquity he was practicing in the and not allow any injustice to be found in his tent. That is, in his life, what he's talking about. These are great steps for someone, this is Dr. Evans speaking, these are great steps for someone who needs to deal with sin, needs to deal with sin to follow, but all of them were based on Zophar's false assumptions that Job was under God's discipline due to sin. Dr. Evans said something here, and I nearly got on it a while ago. It was a good prescription, but a bad diagnosis. That's what I was talking about a while ago with our intentions and our sold-out status. We have good intentions. We're trying to fix the problem. We're trying to fix the problem in front of loving people. The Lord won over the woman at the well by letting her tell him what was wrong. She told him, look, you don't need to be here. You, know, you don't know who I am? Yeah, I know who you are. That's beside the point. That's basically what Jesus said. That's beside the point. I can give you living water. This other stuff is temporary. You know what I'm saying? One prime example right there. The Lord let the person lead. They knew what they were doing wrong. They didn't need nobody to tell them. Case in point. Job didn't, wasn't doing anything wrong. But if he had have been, he didn't need nobody telling him. He needed somebody to love him. Let's go on to chapter 12. <laughs> then Job answered, No doubt you're the people in wisdom. You are the people. And wisdom will die with you. Miss Tommy wished I had paid more attention in her class because reading is not my plus. Math, maybe, but reading is not. But I also have a mind like you. I am not inferior to you. Who doesn't know the things you're talking about? I am a laughing stock to my friends by calling on God who answers me. The righteousness and upright man is a laughing stock. The one who is at ease holds calamity in contempt and thinks it is prepared for those whose feet are slipping. The tents of robbers are safe, and those who trouble God are secure. God holds them in his hands. But ask the animals, and they will instruct you as the birds of the sky, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will instruct you. Let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? The life of every living thing is in his hand, as well as the breath of all mankind. Doesn't the ear... Test words as the pilot tests food. Wisdom is found with the elderly, and understanding comes with long life. The older we get, the more we know. I doubt that. That's Tammy. I, I didn't follow that gene, I don't think. I'm learning, though. Wisdom and strength belong to God's counsel, and understanding are his. Whatever he tears down cannot be rebuilt. Whoever imprisons cannot be released. When he withholds water, everything dries up, and when he releases it, it destroys the land. True wisdom and power belong to him. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away barefoot and makes judges go mad. He releases the bonds put on by kings and fastens a belt around their waist. He leads priests away barefoot and overthrows established leaders. He deprives trusted advisors of speech and takes away the elders' good judgment. He pours out contempt on nobles and disarms the strong. He reveals mysteries from the darkness and brings the deepest darkness into light. He makes the nations great, then destroys them. He enlarges nations, then leads them away. He de deprives the world leaders of reason and makes them wander in a trackless wasteland. They grope around in darkness without light. He makes them stagger like a drunkard. So, basically in a nutshell, Job tells Zophar 
You got the big head. You think you're God's gift to wisdom. That hits home because when I was acting and doing the ways, the things that I was doing, the word was on my side as far as the things, the principles that I stood on. Word was on my side. But the, you know, we talked the other day about the greatest thing, the greatest commandment is love. I can't say that enough, and I've learned that a lot in the last couple of weeks. When I tell you I've read some books, ask Tammy, I have read some books, six or eight in the last few months. Most, uh, most of them is Bob Goff's book about love. Reevaluate my life and how my stand is and how it works. By the way, Bob Goff, also a great Uganda missionary. He talks a little bit about it in his book. I think I've told y'all that before. But, so far, and his friend, you know, the other friends, a lot of what they stood for is how a lot of people do things today. And biblically, there's probably a lot of wisdom behind what they're talking about but they left out a step. They put, they left out a step there. They should have loved on the guy that they knew to be good. Rather than let the devil put doubt in their mind that they were bad. And this, instead of pouring on the love and the, we got, no, you got this and we got it with you. They highlighted the things that could be wrong. Instead of what they knew to be right. The things I've done and the stands I took against different people and politicians, I took a stand off their stand. But from this side of the fence, I couldn't show them that love might look differently if you seen it from my side of the fence. Different, there's all different kind of things that we differ with the world over. It's not just one, there's all different things. I will never be able to show them why I think and feel and believe the way I do if we argue everything out on Facebook or at work. Some of the greatest people that had influence on my life. have been God-fearing, loving people. And they're usually the most popular people. And usually when people want to get into church or get saved or something, those are usually the people they go to. I can name a handful of people right now that had a big influence on my life. All I knew about them was, mainly all I knew about them was, they were good people, they were Christian people, and they were always nice to me. I'm going to go that way before I go Ricky Carroll and mean and all that all the time. Ricky's not that way. I'm just making a point. If Ricky was mean and always putting me down and Talking about how bad and sinful life I live. I want to go to church for Ricky. Me and Tammy got back into church because of a loving friend. She loved us enough to invite us, but that was pretty much the extent of it, other than she was our friend no matter if we went or if we didn't go. She didn't highlight the bad. Let's see where we're at. Uh, Dr. Evans goes on to talk here that counselors, kings, priests, leaders, advisors, nobles, none in humanity can compare to God. The Creator makes nations, then destroys them. Whatever Job struggles in, struggles are, he knew his God was glorious and almighty. 
Basically, in a nutshell, Job is telling everybody how God works and that God was going to see him through this and that no matter what everybody else said, God would prevail, no matter. Let's go on to chapter 13. Look, my eyes have seen all this, my ears have heard and understood it. Everything you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you, yet I prefer to speak to the Almighty and argue my case before God. You use lies like plaster. You are all worthless healers. Job don't think much of his friend there. If only you would shut up and let that be your wisdom. Ricky's over here looking at me. I picked on him too much. The truth shall prevail, right, Ricky? <laughs> uh, hear now my argument and listen to my defense. Would you testify unjustly on God's behalf or speak deceitfully for him? Would you show parti- partiality to him or argue the case in his defense? Would it go well if he examined you? Could you deceive him as you just would deceive a man? Surely he would rebuke you if you secretly showed parti- partiality. That's just too long of a word for me. But anyway, I got through it. Would God's majesty not terrify you? Would his dread not fall on you? Your memorial, memorial sayings are proverbs of ash. Your defense are made of clay. Be quiet and I will speak. Let whatever comes happen to me. I will put myself at risk and make my life in my own hand. Even if he kills me, I will hope in him. I will still defend my ways before him. Yes, this will result in my deliverance, for no godless person can appear before him. Pay close attention to my words. Let my declaration ring in your ears. Now then, I have prepared my case. I know that I am right. Can anyone indict me? If so, I will be silent and die. Only grant these two things to me, God, so that I will not have to hide from your presence. Remove your hand from me and don't let your terror frighten me. Then call and I will answer, or I will speak and you can respond to me. How many iniquities and sins have I committed? Reveal to me my transgressions and sins. Why do you hide your face? And consider me your enemy. Will you frighten a wind-driven leaf? Will you chase after dry straw? For your record, bitter accusations against me, and make me inherit the iniquity of my youth. You put my feet in the stock and stand watch over all my paths, setting a limit for the soles of my feet. A person wears out like something rotten, like a moth-eaten garment. My eyes have seen all this. My ears have understood it. Job was sure he could hold it on and more, hold it on and more with Eliphaz, Bilidad, and Zophar in theological discussion. In other words, they ain't got nothing on him. They were running their mouth, but he was the man when it comes to theology. He knew. He knew more about it than they did, but yet they were running their mouth. He wanted those boys, this is Dr. Evans speaking right here. I thought it was funny how he said it. He said he wanted those boys to know they had nothing on him when it came to knowing and understanding God or how life works. I love it when people explain something in a modern record. He wanted those boys to know. He was just speaking the truth. What Job understood about God allowed him to see that his friends were just whitewashing over the fact with false assumption about what a terrible sinner he was. In other words, they assumed that he was doing wrong, like I said a while ago. Instead of building on the good man that Job was and helping him through it, they assumed he'd done something wrong and built on that. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar had been at their best when they quietly wept with Job. Remember? In Job's advice... In Job's advice is a truth that Solomon would write many years later. Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent, discerning when he seals his lips. I'll just let that stand. Nothing I can do to that make that any better. 
consider Job's famous declaration, even if God kills me, I will hope in him. Other than Jesus himself, Job is a classic biblical example of someone who endured the devil's assault and yet remained faithful to God. Satan took everything Job had, but Job refused to curse God or abandon his faith. This is the kind of resolute faith we need, a faith that perseveres. The only way to lay claim to such faith is to take advantage of what God provides to put on the full armor of God. God didn't show up for the court scene Job attempted to create. Let's let's skip on. Let's go on to chapter 14 and get this knocked out because I really need to get this done. Anyone born of a woman is short of days and full of trouble. He blossoms like a flower, then withers. He flees like a shadow and does not last. Do you really take notice of one like this? Will you bring me unto ju- into judgment against you? Who can produce something pure from what is impure? No one. Since a person's days are determined and and the number of his months depends on you, and since you haven't set limits, he cannot pass. Look away from him and let him rest so that he can enjoy his day like a hired worker. There is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again, and its shoots will not die. If its roots grow old in the ground and its stump starts to die in the soil, the scent of water makes it thrive and produce twigs like a sapling. But a person dies and fades away. His breath, he breathes his life. Where is he? As water disappears from a lake and river becomes parched and dry, so people lie down never to rise again. They will not wake up until the heavens are no more. They will not stir from their sleep. If only you would hide me in the chill and conceal me until your anger passes. If only you would appoint a time for me and then remember me. When a person dies, will he come back to life? If so, I would wait all the days of my struggle until my relief comes. You would call, I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands, for then you would count my steps, but would not take note of my sins. My rebellion would be sealed up in a bag, and you would cover over my iniquity. But as mountains collapse and crumble, and a rock is dislodged from its place, as water wears away stones and torrents washes away the soil from the land, so you destroy a man's hope. You completely empower him as he passes on. You change his appearance and send him away. If his sons receive honor, he does not know it. If they become insignificant, he is unaware of it. He feels only the pain of his own body and mourns only for himself. Truly life is short and filled with grief, but God is not indifferent to these facts. He himself has has entered into our sufferings. Let's turn over to First Peter chapter two. We're going to end it right. Verse twenty four. 1 Peter chapter two, verse twenty four. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that righteous, so that having died to sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Let's read that again. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. In a nutshell, Job threw it all out there. No matter what you guys say, you big heads, Job's words, Dr. Evans' words, you big heads, no matter what you guys say, I have done anything wrong. And God knows that. And it's not for me to produce myself in front of you. If there's never been a place in the Bible any better, right there is the best place that a man can look and see that you don't get your forgiveness from man.
We're going to end it right there. I love you guys. Thank you guys for coming to Sunday school on Sunday. It makes me and Brother Schrader and Thomas all feel good when we have people to talk to while we're up here. Love you guys. Have a great day.